All right, serverless. That's where I come in to your data center and steal your servers. All right, so this talk is really about kind of my own personal uh, kind of journey towards this serverless thing, right? I'm coming from this world of Kubernetes. Kubernetes is everything, run everything in it, and here comes this serverless thing. And for me, it's not so fast. Slow down. So how do I, or how do we typically think about serverless? So when I talk to people, I say, what is serverless? It's like functions. And apparently, you must write them all in JavaScript <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> and the other thing is this events thing, all right? And it's typically, if you listen to people, they will tell you something happens in the cloud, and it calls their function. So we've taken this event-driven architecture with all this promise, and we scoped it all the way down to this limited view of the world. And for me, a person that wants to know how things work or see bigger potential and how things could work, this is a very narrow view on some of these particular principles. Why are we constraining them so early? It's too early to lock them down. And when I look at this, functions represent the how, and then when I look at the events, they represent the when, and I'm asking people, why are you doing serverless? You ever ask that question, like, why am I doing this serverless thing? And I get confused, like, there's no other option. And it's the data. The whole point of this is that you're doing something, I hope, that makes money. Or you owe someone a lot of money, and soon you'll have to pay them back. <laughs> But if you're producing data, this is your data. You own this data, and when this data changes, maybe you're in the manufacturing business, you're shipping real goods to people, and something will change in your system, and ideally, one way to program against that change is to emit an event, and then some logic can receive that event and do something. That's how the whole world works, right? This is a, a thing we've been doing and how humans operate, but yet we want to constrain it to a platform or two. So there's a lot of potential here if we think a little bit more broadly about what this is. And people say data is important. Why is data so important? Well, data is what we collect and store, and then it becomes information once we analyze it, but more importantly, it becomes knowledge once we understand it. And if you don't understand that piece, you're just kind of toiling away. People that do really good with this stuff, they get to this part, okay? This is the point. Yes, this quote is by me yesterday. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> it sounded really good. I'm like, that's going on the slide. Then Twitter. So when you talk to people about serverless, they always give you this use case. I don't know how this became the canonical use case. You upload something to a file bucket. The goal here is I want to take a piece of text and translate it from one language to another. Use some ML API, okay? And then once it hits the object store, an event will be emitted, and it will call your function, and then you will call another API, and then you will return. This is beautiful. This is like the dream come true. You can destroy all your code. You could do no code, but that's a little extreme. <laughs> or you can do this serverless thing. So this is how it's sold. Anyone see the problem with this? Any issues with this? This whole cloud thing, this whole ability to distribute your compute, run anywhere that you want, yet we're going to funnel it all back into one system. This is not necessary. So what's the problem here? Let's, let's throw a little wrench in this. So I work at Google Cloud. I'm not advertising. That's my on-prem, OK? <laughs> let's flip this a little bit. We're going to translate a text file stored on S3 from English to Danish. But I have to do it from my on-premise. So I'm in Google Cloud. And somehow, I need the thing in S3 to call my function in GCP. You all have the solution in your head? People are like, oh, you're screwed, dude. <laughs> so one thing we need is a common way to talk about these events that are emitted when your data changes. So there is a project in the works to define a spec 
around this. And some people are like, oh, we don't need a spec for this. So it's not quite yet done. It's in draft mode, and hopefully it will end up in the CNCF. And the goal here is to define a few things. Number one, the producer owns the type of the event. We're not going to try to standardize every event that can be emitted from every system. That is a fool's errand. But what we want to do, though, is maybe standardize the envelope in which we capture that event, so a content type, what's in the body. And then we need to have some decision, and one of those decisions so far is maybe we can use HTTP to transport this between different systems. And the last thing, whether you like it or not, JSON could be used as a format that you could read these things and deserialize. There's one place that this has worked. Think about networking. You own the data. We encapsulate it in a well-known format, and we can distribute it anywhere in the world. You grab it, pop the header, get the data out of it, and you can go on. So we want to define this. So the work of this project, Cloud Events, is an attempt to standardize at least the envelope and the transport of these events. So we want to democratize these events. They should be able to flow through any system that you want to use. So then you can start to think about a producer using this envelope and either sending it directly to the consumer, my cloud function, or maybe we can build a platform around it where, think about if you were building into some shipping and logistics. Instead of you calling, let's say, the FedEx or shippers APIs, they just call you and tell you exactly what's going on with the things that you care about. So this is kind of that dream of serverless. And I've actually built some things in this kind of model, and it does feel nicer. I'm not calling 5,000 APIs. They call me when there's something to do. So I can see value in this. So what we want, though, is not just a broker. It comes up a lot. Well, you should just use Kafka. You should just use a message queue. Why do those fall short? They have no semantics around how to route something to another endpoint somewhere else. And remember, we're serverless. We're not just talking about servers, the physical machines. We're also talking about the code where you start up, bind to a port, or initialize a connection, or bind to a queue. That's all gone. The only thing you have is the ability to receive some data or an event and process it and go away. So we cannot go out and connect to a queue. We need something to reach back to us. So we need a new thing, so this event gateway. Lucky for us, one of these exists. It's open source. And I don't know if you know anything about the serverless.com folks, but they are actually making this serverless thing usable. I made the mistake of thinking that it's easy to create a function <laughs> in all cloud providers. It's actually really, really painful that people are actually using Terraform to deploy a function. <laughs> I thought there was supposed to be no servers. The config to deploy your function is bigger than the function. Something's not right. So we have this, any function, any event, any provider. So now let's try to solve this problem. Object store, and when I started this project between S3 and Google Cloud or Amazon and Google Cloud, I'm like, oh, we're all wall gardens. It's all about lock-in, us evil cloud providers, lock-in, 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 lock-in. We actually don't spend time in a room doing this, actually, just so you guys know. So what we want is the client to send something to S3, and it turns out Amazon is actually pretty nice. They have a notification system. You can register any endpoint you want to receive the event. You do not have to send it to a Lambda function. This is the first piece I need because they are the originator of that event. So I just need them to redirect it to where I say. We have this new event, event gateway. I can tell them to push it there. And once it lands in the event gateway, I can decide who gets the event next. It could be on-prem, it could be my laptop, it could be a function. I'm going to do blasphemy here. It could be a container. <laughs> yes, you can send HTTP packets to a container, and it will respond. Don't tell anyone else. And then I can do this translate thing. And then I could also do a PubSub model and give multiple functions the exact same event and let them respond. I can do a canary rollout. All the things we've learned well in other models, we can actually do if we have this broker in the middle. You can actually do more intelligent things, but I don't have that much time. I'm going to get to the last piece. I can't come to KubeCon without the demo. Now, this is the silliest thing I've ever done. 
everything that I'm using pretty much doesn't have a version number right now. OK, <laughs> but we're going to try it anyway. So we're going to switch to my laptop. And the goal is, this is the data. Remember the task. Take our input file and translate it into what language? So I don't know if I'm going to do this right. So if you do speak <laughs> the language, let me know. If I offend you, just talk to me later about it. So this is the goal. So the nice thing is, I have this event broker. It's an open source project. Where do you run the event broker? Anyone? Where? Unfortunately, you're going to need some servers again. But it's OK, only for this part. <laughs> so we need an event broker, and we need it to be somewhere. And there it is. And it's nicely done. It actually scales really well. And each of these event brokers will be gateways, throw their configuration in etcd, and then they can actually send traffic to each function that you do. So the next thing we need to do is register our functions. So they have a nice API, actually. So what we do is we say, hey, I have a function, and all we want is this HTTP endpoint. So if you've never used a serverless platform before, I'm going to show you really quickly. So here's a serverless platform, Google Cloud Functions, and I have this trigger. I know it's really tiny to read, but that URL there is how, if I send some packets to it, it's going to call my function on demand. So anything that you have an HTTP endpoint, you can register it as a function. So here it is, we want to add it. So you will see me running some tools. And I built this command line tool just for this demo. So you won't find it online. So if you, after this, you look for event CTL, it doesn't exist, OK? Uh, so we want to say functions, create dash f, and we'll give it this function. So we create the function. The nice thing about this, now you can do late binding. So the function is just registered. And now we can give a subscription slightly like you would do with a message broker, but we just want to tell the, the event gateway what we care about. So we're just going to look at our subscription really quickly. And this is an S3. So it just says, there's going to be an event that shows up at the broker or the event gateway at this path. Notice the semantics here. All your routing layers, authentication layers, all those things work. So you don't have to go and redo everything. You can kind of drop this in and keep moving on. And we're just going to register this. So kubectl, uh, oh, kubectl. It's just stuck there. So we'll do this description. And we're going to create this description. So we're going to do this binding. Now, the nice thing about this, you can actually do updates to your functions because you have this indirection going on. So now we have this description. So now let's get to the task at hand. We want to translate that file. This other thing people don't talk about in serverless world is authentication. How the hell is this function, when it gets an event, going to have permissions to actually read the file in S3? I've got the notification. There's no guarantee that I'm going to actually send the data with the event. In most event-driven architectures, you're not going to put the data in the actual event. So how do you do this? It also turns out, since most cloud providers use open standards, like OCID, you can actually have Amazon trust Google as the authentication provider, just like you do when you log into log in with your Gmail account or log in with your, I won't say the other one because we can't be like them. Um, but OAuth, right? So if we can have one cloud provider trust another, then we don't have to go and pass secrets around to every function that we want to access a resource on the other side. We can map identity between multiple cloud providers. I learned that last night, and it totally works. So when this function gets this event, if everything works, it will actually be able to read the S3 bucket, process the data, put it back. All right, so we're at the final piece, and I'm hoping this works. And look at this. My marketing team is like, what are you doing? This is Amazon. Let it bake. All right, we can do it. All right. So here I've said, Amazon, if there's anything that shows up in that bucket, I want you to send the event to that URL. So that is the IP address of the broker running inside of my cluster, and that's the path for that event. When the event shows up, of course the broker knows nothing about this Amazon-specific event, but what it will do is it will wrap it in the cloud event structure and pass it along to my app. And then I use the normal libraries that I would do if I were running in Lambda 
and any other cloud provider to process the event. Straightforward. So let's do it. Upload here, find the file, input text, hit open, upload. Now, serverless is supposed to be magic, so you're supposed to do nothing else. That's it, you upload something, a chain reaction goes off, and it always works. <laughs> That's what they say. All right. Now, I don't speak Danish, so you have to tell me if it's correct. Let's see. 